Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> Let me first thank the organizers and leadership team of MRS. Uh, over the last four years, I've had the pleasure of working with them, and it's a, it's a great team. We re really appreciate this opportunity today. Um, next, let me acknowledge my wonderful colleagues uh, who are joining me on stage today. They'll, they'll have more of the content. I'll set out the, the, the program, but uh, really the origins of this effort, Materials Genome Initiative, are truly a, a great story of interagency collaboration, and uh, I just can't thank you guys enough for your uh, public service and, and leadership. So, uh, lastly, it's great to be back here at MRS. The last time I was here was over three years ago when we had just announced the Materials Genome Initiative. And, um, you know, in his own words, President Obama, in launching the initiative, said to be competitive in manufacturing also meant to discover, develop, and deploy materials at a much more rapid pace. Uh, this one sentence made all the difference to us, uh, the, the stewards of the initiative, because it helped galvanize uh, the materials community, you, you folks, uh, secured agency commitments, and really did attract a lot of external stakeholder involvement. Um, our goal and mantra hasn't changed. From the beginning, it's been twice as fast, twice as cheap, uh, with an express intent of compressing the time to market for new materials. And choosing time to market was deliberate, because uh, if we're going to grade ourselves on time, we need to better connect our pursuits in research and development with those uh, of industry and manufacturing. Uh, that's what innovation in this space is about. So as I reflect on where we started and where we've been and how it's gone, uh, things have exceeded even my own expectations you know, four years ago as we were planning this effort. So let me give you a few highlights over the last three and a half years. Uh, the first is that we have deployed over $250 million through five federal agencies. That's DOE, DOD, NIST, NSF, and NASA. Uh, that supported over 500 researchers across 200 different institutions, uh, both public and private sector. And um, these are folks working on cutting edge materials innovation. Many of you have been supported, and you may not even uh, be aware of that. So uh, that's a, it's a pretty big metric for us. It's also supported large, larger clustered activity. For example, uh, NIST announced earlier uh, this year a $25 million Center for Excellence. So uh, we're well on our way. This year, we also had the president announce an additional $150 million uh, for the coming year, and that puts us on a 50% growth rate. So all of this is great. Uh, we've also been part of uh, larger efforts around manufacturing. So there are five manufacturing institutes with a distinct advanced materials emphasis. Uh, photonics, advanced composites, lightweight metals, additive manufacturing, uh, wide band gap semiconductors. And uh, we also have in the DOE uh, a recently minted critical minerals hub. All of these efforts include the pursuit of MGI principles in what I would call a public-private partnership context. Yet, despite a strong start, we have much more to do. So today, in, in order to carry that momentum forward, I'm really excited to announce the release of our first Materials Genome Initiative strategic plan. Uh, this is an agency document developed by the agencies designed to talk about how the agencies plan to execute on the goals, the ambitious goals of the initiative, and what they're signing up for over the next five years. Uh, I think this is a very significant step for us. It's as significant, in my opinion, as the white paper that launched the initiative. <clears throat> and um, I hope all of you have a chance to take a look. Um, it can be, let's see, downloaded here. Uh, this has gone through a very robust uh, government, internal government, as well as external review process. Many of your own comments have been taken into consideration. Okay. And you're going to hear a lot more about this. I'm not here to talk uh, in details, but you will get a little bit more texture around the strategic plan. Uh, that said, though, you know, despite our great story of success so far, our good trajectory, um, we as a group should also begin addressing areas where we may be falling short. You know, when I was here three and a half years ago, uh, I think folks were grappling with what does this MGI mean for my research and how do I fit in? And despite our success and progress over that time period, 
Uh, I'm worried that some folks are still grappling with this question. This plan, I believe, should answer many of those questions. Uh, that being said, let me be clear, and that is uh, MGI is not, you know, we don't view MGI as a tent for everybody to crowd under to, you know, gain, you know, new support for their pet materials projects. Uh, and I get it, you know, unlike previous federal initiatives, uh, we in the MGI community haven't really drawn as clear boundaries around, you know, the elements, what's in, what's out. Uh, but but this, this initiative is about change. It's a movement. And if, if I had, you know, five minutes with each of you, I may have a shot at convincing you how you fit personalizing that message. So what I'm, what I'm asking you is that we need this audience uh, to get, engage in new ways. Uh, the MV, MGI is an initiative uh, always defined by you, the community, for you, the community. This is sort of the, uh, the image of our initiative. And, you know, I'm not going to talk long on this, but I just want to remind this audience that when we started this effort, we really did believe, and we still believe today, that uh, there's an equal emphasis on all parts of this picture. Not just computation, not just data, not just instrumentation. It's really the intersection of those, and you're going to hear more and more about integration as a core theme for this initiative going forward. That's a core tenant of the strategic plan. Um, this initiative is focused on understanding how to describe materials in a way that is both meaningful and compatible with storing, sharing, and developing knowledge as a community. That's the genome. But MGI is more than this. It's also about moving materials to market. So if we're going to be honest about this goal, it's time we start bridging our pursuits in this room with those outside of this room. And I think the, uh, it's going to become more clear, but my view is that the frontiers for the Materials Genome Initiative are going to be you know, in, in things such as manufacturing and data and this full idea of fully integrated research. So let me just close with the following call to action uh, to this group, to MRS, and that's, you know, the first three things. So the first is uh, just resist the temptation to put your own work and research in a box. And, you know, I think MGI, I think of MGI as a spark for this community to design and catalyze the necessary uh, crosstalk and collaboration. That's the first. The second is just think about how you might pursue the principles of MGI in your own work. That could be in your research, working with applied research or industry. It could be with uh, data, so on and so forth, new curriculum. And the third is, while this professional society, MRS, has done a, a, a lot to support this initiative, it can do more. So I just ask you as the MRS community, empower your leadership to take a more uh, pro proactive role in how we execute and design this initiative in the years forward. We want to keep hearing from you, and uh, you should know that. So with that, let me just say thank you. I really appreciate you guys coming out, and I'm going to turn the floor over to Linda. Thank you, Cyrus. So I'll try to stand near, near to the microphone. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about some of the uh, excuse me, the basic science opportunities for the materials genome, focusing on the science. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the community-based strategic planning to remind you of what resources are out there. Then I'm going to cover some grand challenges, and I will briefly touch at the end just to remind you of some of the funding opportunities that are, are available for this kind of research. So the uh, Defining the Scientific's program for MGI started several years ago, well before the uh, presidential announcement. Uh, there were multi-agency workshops, the uh, Department of Energy ran a workshop, both from basic sciences perspective and from uh, the perspective of OSCAR, the uh, Advanced Scientific Computing Research, because computers are indeed an a important part of the MGI. As you look at the Materials Genome Initiative, and this is a little bit like nanoscience. I remember when nanoscience was announced, I said, well, we've been doing nanoscience for a long time. And there are aspects of the materials genome activities that have been going on a long time in this community. 
What the MGI recognizes and what these reports talk about is that this is an important time because the experimental tools, the computational tools, and the theoretical tools are at a point where we can start to combine these to really accelerate the progress of everyone's research, both in understanding and discovering materials, but also in accelerating their progress towards having a material that can be used uh, commercially. So I'll focus on the science part, and then Lori will talk about the uh, accelerating the materials for manufacturing. Uh, prior to the, uh, to the workshops that defined the MGI, there was also the ICME, the Integrated Computational Materials Engineering Workshops. These focus largely on structural materials, but there's a lot of insights from these reports that really help to inform the materials genome initiative. So, so this is also some very good references. The most recent reports, NSF had a workshop in December that was just published in the Solid State Material Sciences uh, uh, Journal about uh, the Materials Genome Initiative. This was led by Juan de Pablo and the others who are listed on the, uh, uh, as the uh, co-authors. Uh, and they have a series of recommendations. Again, a very good reference. And I just learned as we were coming in today that the materials, uh, the, the bulletin, the MRS bulletin is going to publish the report from a recent workshop on combinatorial research. Again, another really important reference, and I really, was really pleased to hear that MRS is publishing this activity, because combinatorial tools, whether they be for theory or for experiment, are indeed uh, an important part and an aspect of the, uh, of the MGI. So lots of good references for you to use to help uh, understand what some of the uh, opportunities are. For the strategic plan of the Materials Genome Initiative, uh, we ran a series of workshops that helped to define grand challenges for both hard and soft materials. These brought people from academia, uh, national federal laboratories and industry together to talk about what were the grand challenges that could, for which the materials genome approach could really make a difference. What did we need to do? What were these opportunities? So I'm going to spend the next few minutes telling you about some of these opportunities. Uh, and these uh, workshops are summarized as an appendix in the strategic plan. So again, go to the strategic plan if you want to get the, uh, the details. There's also websites that are referenced. Again, the references are in the strategic plan where you can actually see the view graphs that were used and the uh, information compiled at the workshops. So if you look at the grand challenging, uh, the cross-cutting grand challenges that were found in virtually every materials class, uh, not surprising, it's building multi-scale both in time and space. Uh, theories and models, including using data genomics to see if we can stretch and get more science out of the data that, that, are, that are coming out of our experiments and out of theory. Uh, extrapolating the data to get information and insights about different uh, material systems. Uh, developing accurate models of interfaces. Uh, interfaces uh, are so dominant in defining materials properties uh, we are really at a place now, and you've seen that throughout this meeting this week, of, of getting real understanding of what goes on at interfaces, whether they be at the surface or a buried interface, or interfaces between uh, different uh, materials in a device where you can get new functionality from the device because of the interfaces. Uh, moving materials characterization from three dimensions to four dimensions, the fourth dimension typically is time. But there are other dimensions that people talk about, um, composition, a whole host of things. Uh, developing new methodology for in operando experimentation. I was always a big believer in in situ, and we've, in situ, of course, is looking at materials in specific environments. In operando is not only having them in that environment, but having them work in that environment and watching how that functionality evolves with time uh, or use. Uh, Real-time uh, theory, simulation, and experiment interactions. Uh, this is a, is a real challenge and is becoming uh, especially uh, important as we generate huge amount of data, whether they be at synchrotrons or ultra-fast uh, systems or neutron sources 
or out of the analytical equipment in your labs, the electron microscopes, the scanning probes, the whole host of equipment, uh, spectroscopy tools, and trying to get the most out of that data in real time so you can adjust the experiment and you don't have to wait till the next time you're able to get on the equipment to change your parameters. Uh, and then, uh, again, harnessing the complexity of new materials uh, systems for different functionalities. So I've put in a few uh, highlights about each of these. Uh, I'll touch on these, and then I'll go into the materials classes. And some of these will just be up for a few moments. But because this talk is being videotaped, you can go back and look at the talk and pull out the references and follow up as, as you would like. So one of the cross-cutting grand challenges is looking at high-throughput first principles modeling and data genomics. Uh, the materials project uh, developed at MIT and now implemented at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab through NERSC uh, as an online resource for the community. Uh, first worked on uh, new oxides and materials for batteries, uh, looking at calculations, doing theory to define new compounds, and then testing those in actual systems. Uh, they uh, currently have, have a focus also on elastic properties for, uh, for various materials, and they have over 1,200 compounds for metals, alloys, oxides, and semiconductors, all of which are available to the community. One of the emphasis of the Materials Genome Initiative are community resources and, uh, and trying to bring data available so everyone can benefit from the uh, investment in that research, and the Materials Project is a, is a good example of that. Another excellent example was this year's uh, MRS Metal uh, Group, and this is, of course, the work of Sharon Glotzer and, and Nick Kotev, Kotoff, excuse me, from the University of Michigan. And I thought this was a great recognition by the Materials Research Society to recognize work that was focused on integration of computation and experiment uh, to, uh, for the discovery and design of nanoparticles and understanding self-assembly. This was a superb presentation. Both people gave it, and, and they had a wonderful approach. Sharon talked about the experimental work, and Nick talked about the theory. It was really wonderful. So if you were not there, I encourage you to go and watch the video of, of that presentation. But this is an example of how the community was really ready for the MGI. Work like this, where they have a, a clear integration of, of theory and experiment. Uh, there have been a lot of advances in, uh, in tools. Here are a few examples. The one at the top is uh, from Berkeley, uh, Paul Alvisato et al. in developing uh, in situ imaging for an electron microscope using graphene to, to hold, the, hold the liquid uh, when they do the, uh, the research. Uh, looking at battery properties, again, this is another electron microscope example. This one is out of the University of Maryland. Uh, but the work was done by PNNL and Sandia National Laboratories were involved in the developing of, uh, of this technique to look at how lithium moves in actual operation of a battery, meaning they were char doing charge and discharge across the, the, uh, the carbon nanotube and looking at the effects of the uh, lithiation. Uh, and the last example is some, some work, again, in, in batteries research from X-ray scattering the X-ray scattering facilities uh, in this country have taken huge steps in their in situ capabilities. Uh, they have combinatorial capabilities. They have in situ um, uh, stages, in situ uh, uh, cells at the ends of their uh, beam lines where you can look at materials as they grow or as they operate. Uh, and this is, is one example uh, from Cornell uh, working with Brookhaven National Laboratory. Uh, Neutron scattering and X-ray scattering. This is an example from John Parisi at Stony Brook on uh, looking at uh, photocatalytic hydrogen evolution in situ using high pressure um, and scattering coupled with modeling to advance the science. Moving now to these materials classes. Uh, correlated materials was one of the materials classes uh, that were assessed as part of these workshops. Uh, so the uh, grand challenges that relate to science, the ones in gray relate, to, uh, relate more to devices than applied research. Uh, so rapid learning how to rapidly survey materials, uh, looking at the properties that are relevant to correlated electron materials, which, which are arguably very challenging, uh, using multivariate variable uh, op optimization techniques 
to, for guided synthesis. Uh, and the last one is, is this one that was common, was the integration of simulation and experiments, particularly at, at uh, user facilities. So one of the examples that I have, this is from Oak Ridge, looking at uh, strontium uh, titanate, a ferroelectric material, where they have indeed enabled the, uh, being able to do the measurements and do the simulation using the Oak Ridge uh, supercomputing facility and being able to do this uh, simultaneously. So as they are getting results, they can compare them to the simulation or have the simulation first and then adjust the experiments. So they can, uh, during one run at the uh, neutron irradiation facilities, or neutron characterization facilities, excuse me, at the SNS, they can adjust the experiments and get more information out of them. Uh, so uh, this is, there's some support from what they call the Center for Accelerated Materials Modeling uh, that is enabling uh, this research as well as the Oak Ridge Leadership Class Computing Facility. <clears throat> Excuse me, here's some uh, uh, from NSF, uh, work at Rutgers University on the uh, theoretical prediction of, uh, of uh, the properties of uh, iridium, iridium uh, telluride looking at uh, large spin order coupling, which they did predictions, they confirmed and characterized them with X-ray optical scanning tunneling and so on, a large number of, of, uh, of, of characterization tools. And this integration of the research has, has enabled them to uh, predict some new compounds that otherwise might not have been discovered. Uh, electronic and photonic materials, predicting uh, excited states transport, very important. Uh, Non-equilibrium structures, also very important. These come up over and over again. Uh, for these materials, of course, you want to model the electrical and optical properties, and you want to correlate that with structure. Uh, so again, uh, implementation of tools that can, can do this in a very, very fast manner. Uh, here are three examples from various groups. The first one is from NREL, looking at uh, uh, computational prediction of uh, high absorption thin film photovoltaic materials. NREL uh, and, and Alex Zunger, uh, when he was at NREL, he's now at the University of Colorado. Uh, this group has been a leader in really uh, trying to model uh, solar materials and integrate it with data and accelerate the advances of uh, the development of solar materials. Some work out of MIT on observation and uh, uh, prediction of, uh, of how light is confined in a pattern dielectric slab. Uh, and the last example is in graphene uh, out of Wisconsin on uh, calculation of, of terahertz frequency conductivity. Um, again, very uh, important work. Uh, organic electronic materials, uh, looking at uh, molecular crystal structures and polymorphs. Uh, anything involving polymers adds a new lot of uh, additional complexity from a chemistry perspective and, and looking at molecular structures. Uh, so the challenges are shown here. Uh, the two examples that I have are both from uh, the groups now at University of Chicago and the University of Wisconsin-Madison looking at the com combination of, uh, of computing calculations and experiments to get better glasses. Biomaterials, a very long list. Uh, this is probably an indication that, that uh, moving biomaterials, uh, there's a lot of discovery science that is open there. Uh, there's fewer uh, examples of moving that on to uh, commercial applications. Uh, theoretical and, uh, and uh, modeling tools that, that address both uh, living systems as well as, in, uh, as the, uh, their counterparts that are artificially made. Uh, developing strategies to combine chemi to obtain chemically sequenced synthetic polymers. Uh, looking at three-dimensional self-assembly. Uh, with a chemistry that mimics the fidelity of DNA. And their example was a non-DNA DNA. DNA. Uh, and again, there's a lot of research going on in this, but this is an area where there is a, a strong belief that more aggressively combining computation and experiment will accelerate progress. Uh, 
uh, here's an example from one of uh, DOE's Energy Frontier Research Centers uh, looking at uh, a three-dimensional model of uh, cellulose uh, and using that to accelerate the development of, uh, of uh, better products, better molecular structures for, uh, uh, for biofuel production. Uh, it's led by Penn State. Uh, catalysts are ubiquitous in industry. Uh, they are also a very dominant theme, both in chemical sciences and material sciences research. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities, and people are very actively working in uh, trying to combine theory with uh, experiment to accelerate the development of better catalysts. Probably the first time I heard of, uh, of uh, success, of uh, aggressive use of, uh, of combinatorial techniques, it was in the development of catalysts. Uh, so this is a, a really important area. Uh, and there are lots of opportunities uh, that, that you, can, you can read on the slide. Uh, and there are lots of examples. Uh, this is of work at Tufts on uh, development of uh, highly selective catalysis. Uh, work at, uh, this is a, a combined study of multiple national laboratories and, and Stony Brook on, uh, on looking at non-noble metal electrocatalysts for water oxidation and uh, oxygen reduction. And the final example is out of SLAC on designing selective ca uh, catalysts for reduction of carbon dioxide to methanol. Uh, so uh, Jens Norscroft's group at SLAC has been a leader in this area, but there are many groups working in, in catalysis, both theory and experiment, to try to accelerate and reach a catalyst by design uh, capability. Uh, lightweight and structural materials, another area with lots of research that has been going on. Uh, some of the grand challenges they, they uh, pulled out beyond what is already going on it was looking at corrosion behavior. Uh, again, uh, doing a better way of defining represent, representative volumes for higher length scale experiments, trying to take what you can do on a small scale and expand it to larger volumes. Uh, and then a big access on uh, emphasis on databases for for a whole host of, mater of materials properties that are critical to to structural materials. Uh, there are lots of big research groups working on this, uh, funded by a number of uh, federal agencies. This is one from uh, from the Department of Energy. This is Prisms at the again the University of Michigan. Uh, the important thing about this group, uh, this is one of the first groups we funded to actually put software available for the community to use. And they have beta testing going on right now with their software. They're working on uh, aluminum, lightweight materials. Uh, and their code release is scheduled for the summer, along with what they've called the materials commons, where they're going to put the data up to make it available broadly to the community. Uh, so this work is, uh, is being tied in very closely to the work at NIST that you will probably hear about from, uh, from Lori. Uh, uh, Teresa Pollock has been a leader in this field. She uh, was responsible for some of the early workshops for ICME. Uh, and uh, her group's research is also making uh, great progress in looking at thermodynamic modeling and using that to, uh, to predict new phases and their properties in, uh, for for structural applications. Uh, polymers, again, uh, there are a lot of all the challenges identified for polymers were in the, in the basic science area. Uh, mesoscale models, uh, very important. They said they have rheology issues as well as, as chemistry. Uh, designing a, a hierarchical structure for functionality, the uh, ubiquitous 3D, 4D kinds of uh, of uh, challenges. Uh, there's one example. Uh, this is, again, from a group of labs, Argonne, Sandia, Oak Ridge, and, and a European university looking at predictions of van der Waals forces. Uh, nice progress is being made, but uh, there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, the area where we have a really large amount of work going on that is new is in energy storage. Uh, there are, is a lot of work funded by DOE in this area, as well as others. Uh, a lot of good ideas and grand challenges, 
enables new stable new battery systems with high energy density, uh, looking at uh, low rate degradation mechanisms because that contributes to the long-term failure modes for batteries and to, uh, as always, accelerating synthesis and discovery of new materials. I have a number of examples that I won't go over, uh, some from Oak Ridge uh, and two of them from the uh, Joint Center for Energy Storage Research, the, the BES hub, uh, for uh, looking at, at uh, beyond lithium ion battery materials. They have done a really good job. One of the innovative things they have, are working on is an electrolyte genome. So not just trying to predict materials for the electrodes, but actually trying to look at electrolytes and being able to use first principles theory uh, in combination with molecular dynamics and other codes uh, to predict new, uh, new uh, materials for electrolytes. Uh, polymers composites. They're sort of similar to lightweight materials, but bringing in the complexity of polymers in addition to the reinforcements, a lot of emphasis on interfaces uh, in these materials. Uh, I mentioned the Elect uh, Energy Frontier Research Centers, and I will wind up here in a couple of minutes. Uh, the, uh, in 2014, we recompeted the Energy Frontier Research Centers, and I mention this because we emphasize research to advance the rate of materials and chemical discovery as part of the funding opportunity announcement. And as a consequence of the 32 uh, newly supported uh, Energy Frontier Research Centers, eight of them have a major emphasis on, on cross-cutting materials and chemistry by design, or predictive materials and chemical sciences, whatever you want to call it, MGI. Uh, so, so that has been really exciting. I listed uh, three examples, uh, one on catalysis, uh, Laura Gagliardi at Minnesota, uh, one on uh, functional layered materials, uh, John Perdue at Temple, and then uh, the NREL uh, Center for Next Generation Materials by Design, looking at solar materials. But if you go to the website for the Energy Frontier Research Center, there's a wide range of, of activities that relate to MGI in these, uh, in these new activities. Uh, very quickly on funding opportunities uh, in the FY15 budget request, uh, Basic Energy Sciences has an uh, initiative on computational material sciences. Uh, this is to fund large centers to develop community-based software and data uh, for functional materials. Uh, the uh, idea is that four teams would be funded for multi-year awards. Um, so hopefully this, this will, will come about, but this is, again, I emphasize it's part of the request and we're still in a continuing resolution. Uh, there's a slide here on what's different. I've used this in the uh, BES talk that was Tuesday night, so I won't dwell on it here, but it'll be in the, in the, uh, in the uh, digital uh, version of this presentation, so you can look at that. Uh, NSF runs funding opportunity announcements uh, every year that relates to the Materials Genome Initiative. Uh, John Sluter is the lead for that out of uh, Material Sciences. Uh, this has been an ongoing activity. Uh, they require uh, an iterative feedback loop. Uh, they have to have, you have to have a materials person, you have to have a data person, a, a computational theory simulation person as part of the team. So these are team research activities. Uh, they also have a mid-scale materials innovation platform call that is uh, coming out a uh, software infrastructure for sustained innovation. And to conclude, uh, what's different about the materials genome for basic science is that while it's building on the foundation that we have for theory, characterization, and synthesis research, it is really integrating those activities beyond the individuals that have already been doing it and trying to move this into an approach that's used by the whole community. Uh, we are trying to make the resources available to, to enable that, both for data and for software, and uh, really accelerate what we can do to discover new materials as well as improve on the properties of existing materials. Uh, and I'd like to leave you with the thought that, that the grand challenges here cross-cut all materials classes and all parts of the community. And uh, Lori will bring us up to date on what's available for applied research and relates to manufacturing.
So Linda did a really great job at showing us all the great, brilliant science that's going on already to support these grand challenges that came out in the initiative that, um, that was just in the initiative strategic plan that just came out today. Um, and, but as Cyrus pointed out, we really want to also start to think about manufacturing. So my job today is really a simple one, to tell you, first of all, that the MGI is thinking about manufacturing and try to convince you of that, um, but to also tell you, honestly, we have a long way to go and we can plug into several really exciting things going on around the government that can help us do that more effectively. But also to convince you, as materials innovators, that you should care about manufacturing. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes uh, telling you a little story that you all know very well, probably, um, but to remind you why you need to think about manufacturing as the materials innovation culture for the U.S. Um, if you look at uh, the U.S. over the last 20 years, we've lost significant leadership in terms of the market for advanced technology products. And this just is a graph that shows the U.S. trade balance for advanced technology products. And you can see that in around 2001, we started to really have a shift where we went from a, a major exporter to a major importer of these types of products. And so as the line continues to go down and down in this graph to 2010, you can see we're really losing our ability to, to, to give the world our advanced technology products through commercialization. So why should you care about that? It's 11% of the GDP, 12 million U.S. jobs. The advanced technology products, though, are 57% of U.S. exports. And there's been a lot of analysis done of this, and I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, what people have decided to attribute this to is the missing middle, saying that we have done a good job at funding basic research in government and universities, and a great job at funding the other end in commercialization. But really, when we go from production in the laboratory to capacity to produce a prototype, we don't fund that. We don't put our investments in that area. And so essentially this model that the U.S. has adopted over many, many years of the great innovations happening in a, in a basic research laboratory setting and commercialization being very separate um, is clearly not working anymore. Somehow we have to pull those things more closely together. And, um, and a very uh, a profound example of this, of course, is the flat panel display case study, which has been, uh, you know the end of the story, of course. But do you know that in 1954, that was the first time that a flat panel display for a television set was predicted by GE scientists? And then in 1966, that was invented, and the discovery and the invention was made in U.S. laboratories. And then, of course, uh, developed by Fujitsu, the commercialization and the product development was done for, by Fujitsu and Sony and Samsung, and that's the end of the story because we are major importers of that, not exporters. There's a lot of other areas where the U.S. has, ha has almost no market share in products invented in the U.S., amazing products, oxide ceramics, digital watches, interactive electronic games, lithium ion batteries, and the list is really long. So that's the story, but why should you care? Well, you should care because there was, there was a book written by Pisano and Shai out of uh, Harvard. I think it's a brilliant book. It's called Producing Prosperity, Why America Needs a Manufacturing Renaissance. And in it, it says, when countries lose the ability to manufacture, they lose the ability to innovate. So when countries lose the ability to manufacture, they lose the ability to innovate. And they attribute that to a lot of different things, including the fact that we don't have the robust ecosystem, we, don't, we lose our relationship with customers, we lose our relationship with the supply chain, we aren't making iterative developments, we therefore don't make leapfrog developments. There's a lot behind this. It's a really interesting story, but that's why you, as the innovators, should care. So the Materials Genome Initiative, you know, was launched a couple of years ago. But did you know it was launched beside the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership, um, which operates under the President's Council uh, of Advisors on Science and Technology, and who came up with the idea of developing a national network for manufacturing innovation, which President Obama announced um, in recent years. 
So it was really launched in, in a larger picture, a larger context of government promoting innovation, technology, and manufacturing. So many of you may look at the MGI as a discovery tool. We see great science going all the on all the time now that is starting to implement MGI tools. But, but really, the, the true goal of the MGI, of course, is to change the paradigm in the materials world from being an iterative process of this of discover, design, build, test, discover, design, build, test, someday throw it over the fence to manufacturing, it doesn't work, it comes back, we start over to really dialing in the materials properties for optimum product-based outcomes. And that's a whole different ballgame. So is MGI really addressing issues closer to manufacturing in the missing middle? Well, we're, we're, we're starting to. Um, and I just have a few examples of programs around the government where we're starting to think of that much more applied research off toward manufacturing. And, and as an example, I have one from, um, from Chuck Ward out of AFRL from the Materials and Manufacturing Directorate. Um, this is the in Integrated Computational uh, Methods for Composite Materials Program. In it, they're trying to realize the full potential for applying um, polymer matrix composites in aerospace systems, realizing that we are currently limited because our tools, our simulation tools, uh, at, at one end, so don't adequately ca uh, capture or represent the complexity that it is required in the total system design. It's a $14.8 million program. It's a five-year DOD program, um, again, to integrate polymer matrix components into engine and airframe, um, into engines and airframes. But ultimately, the goal is to, to, to start to integrate high-fidelity processing and mechanics and simulation tools all across from the, from the beginning of the, the materials design all the way into the product. Um, it's being executed by GE Aviation and Lockheed Martin, so heavy industry investment, um, with partners, of course, AFRL and, and University of Dayton, University of Michigan, and others. Uh, another example is out of EERE, and, and Will Joost was, um, uh, gave me this slide from DOE. Um, the objective of, the, of this program is to use MGI, and they say slash ICME, for advanced high-strength steel. And they use that terminology because, of course, uh, a, a lot of the early concepts from MGI were birthed out of ICME, as, as, um, as, uh, as Linda alluded to, but it is much bigger than that. Um, basically, the objective is, is to apply these techniques to develop two new classes of steel, uh, for vehicle weight reduction and integrated into the vehicle design. Uh, with, uh, and in this uh, program, they're really pushing the mechanical properties. Uh, they're, they're planned to far exceed what is currently available for high strength steels and also have targets of, re of weight reduction by th greater than 35% and uh, a total cost savings as well. It's a six million uh, four year DOE program with a 2.5 million dollar industry cost share. So in these types of programs, we're already seeing industries starting to get invested and engaged. Um, and, and the engagement is demonstrated by investment, of course. Um, this, the whole point of this, of course, is then to connect fundamental material science to bulk simulations and then validate this in the car against large system demonstrations. So those are just two examples. There are many others going around, uh, on around the government. But, um, but the one thing that I wanted to mention is that the materials innovation infrastructure is really there to bridge across all levels, from fundamental discovery science to the manufactured product. And those two case studies just showed that. What they're trying to do is develop computational tools that can bring us from one end of the spectrum, from the basic materials discovery and design, to integration into the product. And so we need in, to develop this innovation infrastructure in order to, what I would say, compress that distance between that basic research that's going on in your laboratories and that commercialization of the final product. And in order to do that, we need to, of course, develop experimental tools that can cross the continuum from, from basic research to, to, to um, commercialization, computational tools, and data. 
NIST has recently announced a new center of excellence, uh, the Center for Hierarchical Materials Design out of Chicago, uh, Northwestern University with the University of Chicago. It's a $25 million uh, for five years program with the, uh, a possible addition of uh, five more years. Their goal is to develop the next generation computational tools, databases, and experimental t techniques to support the MGI approach. Of course, they're not going to do it alone. They're going to do it with a lot of you. Um, we're going to partner with them, and there are many other agencies who have similar uh, programs and announcements being um, in, the, in the next few years, as Linda also mentioned. Um, and they're also going to serve with us, with NIST, as a national resource for verified codes and curated databases um, so that others can have access to tools that can enable the MGI approach. Within NIST, we are uh, spending a lot of our efforts building up the data infrastructure, of course, again, with many, many partners. We recently established the Office of Data and Informatics, specifically with an eye toward um, enhancing and enabling data exchange for materials data for the MGI. And under that, in that context, we are building databases and, and repositories, again, in collaboration with ASM International, DOE, and many, many others. And we're looking at the possibility of developing a series of federated databases with the National Data Service. It's just in discussion right now. Um, we're also developing tools for capture, mining, and analytics. And of course, uh, something that's definitely in this mission is to develop standards for the sharing of this type of data so that everybody can have access to it um, for ontologies and metadata. Partnering is essential to make this happen. No one agency hasn't, has the money in their budget to develop um, a, a repository for all of the materials data out there. Um, but it is important that we do make that happen because we'd like it to happen on, uh, on the scale that it happened in bio biology. When biology got access to, um, st started sharing data and the, and the NCBI was established to share genomics data, it revolutionized the biology field. And it can do the same in the materials field if we can have that kind of broad access to each other's data. So the MGI is thinking about uh, manufacturing in the context of their strategic plan. I'll just mention a few, few areas where, where this, is, uh, this is discussed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, it, there are some milestones in the strategic plan that specifically talk about uh, manufacturing. I point out a few of these that I won't read. Um, but there are places where MRS can definitely play a critical role in MGI meets manufacturing. And just at the bottom, I'll just mention this one, perhaps defining venues that promote interactions between academics and industry researchers, including students, um, that can come together and talk about MGI-related projects. And there are several grand challenges. Linda went through, uh, I think, a really nice exhaustive list of grand challenges. I'll just mention a few that touch on areas closer to manufacturing. In the area of catalysis, create new synthesis strategies that enable catalyst designs, incorporate multiple functions defined at the molecular level, and can be applied at all levels from the laboratory through scale up and commercialization. And in correlated materials, develop sub-10 nanometer device fabrication facilities looking toward a nano 3D printer in the long term. And in organic electronics, create a liquid phase manufacturing paradigm. So those are just some examples of, of, of what's in the strategic plan that does start to touch on manufacturing. Now, can MGI alone tackle problems with the missing middle? Of course not. Um, that's a big problem that the U.S. Has, has, that we have a lot of people trying to address. Um, as I mentioned, the MGI was, was born uh, um, with the Advanced Manufacturing Program, and along with that came the National Network for Manufacturing Innovation. So I want to spend a minute talking about that and how, how that could really link up with the MGI to form a, a larger partnership toward manufacturing. Um, the National Network for Manufacturing Innovation is conceived of as a network of innovation institutes that are specifically focused in, in, in areas of research where they're going to build the processes to build the next generation of products. So it's specifically there to address this missing middle 
in our technology um, uh, spectrum. It also addresses workforce development in a teaching laboratory type of environment. And there, the president has a vision for 45 institutes in the next 10 years. And in his budget in FY14, there was a net, there was there were, there was a budget for 15 institutes for um, menu, to support the NNMI. So. What happens uh, if, if some of the money doesn't come through? Well, absent congressional action, uh, the network has already begun. And as uh, Cyrus pointed out, the, there are already several innovation institutes that have been born. And these have been born out of agency funds. The first was additive manufacturing. That is now called America Makes. And that was funded by DOD. It's a $50 million federal investment with $60 million matching funds and over 100 partners in Youngstown, Ohio. The next one was Power Electronics, funded by DOE. It's a $70 million federal investment with $70 million matching. Uh, academics should note that the lead here is NC State. And there are 17 industry partners, but also five university partners there. Um, in digital manufacturing, that's in Chicago, $70 million federal funds out of DOD and $240 million matching funds. Uh, 41 industry, 23 university partners. In lightweight and modern metals, that's out of Detroit. Um, that was the only one that explicitly called out the MGI in their announcement. That's a $70 million federal investment with $70 million matching, 34 industry and nine university partners. And then, of course, the advanced uh, composites manufacturing was, was announced and it's being competed now. Proposals are under evaluation out of DOE. And finally, the integration, integrated photonics manufacturing out of DOD. Uh, the call for that just went out. The um, recently, the proposals are due December 19th, but that's a $100 million federal funds going into that um, managed out of AFRL. Uh, so the one that the current BAA that's out is on integrated photonics manufacturing. Again, $100 million. The due date's December 19th. The point is there to develop an end-to-end -end photonics ecosystem in the U.S., so some of, the, some of the technologies they're looking to support are ultra-high speed transmission of signals, uh, new high performance uh, information processing, and sensors and imaging. So with that, um, I'd like to say that in the next few years, we have a huge amount of federal dollars going into addressing specifically this missing middle through this series of innovation institutes being stood up by the agencies with the president calling for funding for more. Um, in the next few years, it's critical that the MGI formally try to link and leverage to these programs. And since many of them are materials focused, the majority of them are materials focused, um, it's important that MGI step in and try to help them uh, develop the infrastructure around these areas that are of interest. And with that, they can help us also develop the innovation infra infrastructure for the U.S. And will materials manufacturing remain a priority? Well, the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership um, uh, reconvened under AMP 2.0, and they recently sent a report to the President in October. And in that, they provided technology strategy recommendations in three prioritized manufacturing technology areas in the U.S. In advanced sensing, controls and platforms for manufacturing, in visualization, informatics, and digital manufacturing, and finally, in advanced materials manufacturing. So yes, you can see that it will be remaining a priority. And with that, I'll close.